This is the Nutrient Song featuring protein, carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, fats, and water. Let's go! Proteins, they keep my muscles strong. I eat chicken and fish to get protein on my dish. I know I need them, and protein's delish. So why not eat them? Egg, whites, and nuts give me protein for lunch. Yuck, 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 carbohydrates. I could get some from cake, but that's not good for my sake. That's too much sugar intake. I need whole grains on my plate. Some bread and pasta. Oats and rice have lots of carbs to enter me for energy. Vitamins, they keep me healthy, man. They help my immune system. I love to get lots of them. In apples and oranges, carrots. Peaches and pears, bananas, tomatoes, green beans, broccoli, they're all there. Minerals like calcium, you need them to eat them. You get it? Teeth are made of them. So all your bones, you should love them and get them from dairy products like milk and cheese. Also, green leafy vegetables give me minerals I need. And don't forget to eat fatty foods. Fatty foods? Not the kind of make you fatty, dude. Cool, dude. Not fatty meat, but eating fish is key. And oils from olives and coconut is for love. It no joke. I eat healthy fats from nuts and egg yolk. I'm on a mission to soak my body up with nutrients. But all these foods, I'm gonna choke. Oh, I need something to drink. You need a glass of the last nutrient your body needs it you better drink it you need a glass of the last nutrient your body needs it you better drink it my friends remember eat right and play hard carbohydrates are biomolecules that are composed of carbon hydrogen and oxygen atoms in the ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 we can represent the proportion of these elements within carbohydrate molecules with the formula CH2O. Most carbohydrates are characterized as either monosaccharides, disaccharides, or polysaccharides. The term saccharide is just another word for sugar. The prefixes mono, di, and poly refer to the number of sugars in the molecule. Mono means one. So a monosaccharide is a carbohydrate made of one unit of sugar. The prefix di means two. So a disaccharide is a carbohydrate made of two units of sugar. And poly means many. So a polysaccharide is made of many sugar units bonded together. Let's talk about monosaccharides first. Monosaccharides are the building blocks, or monomers, of all carbohydrates. Common monosaccharides include glucose, fructose, and galactose. Glucose is by far the most abundant monosaccharide. It's water-soluble, easily transported through an organism, and is the energy source for cellular respiration and the production of ATP. Fructose is the primary monosaccharide found in fruits and plants, and galactose is the primary monosaccharide found in milk. All of these monosaccharides are six carbon sugars with the chemical formula C6H12O6. They can be depicted chemically as either straight chains or rings. Disaccharides are formed when monosaccharides are joined together through dehydration reactions forming what are called glycosidic linkages. Common disaccharides include maltose, which is made up of two glucose molecules, sucrose, also known as table sugar, which is made up of glucose and fructose, and lactose, or milk sugar, 
which contains glucose and galactose. Polysaccharides are formed when glucose monomers link together to form long chains. These long chains of glucose units are ideal for storing energy. The chains can be straight or branched. Plants store energy in the form of amylose, which has straight chains, or amylopectin, which is branched. Animals differ from plants in that they store energy in the form of glycogen, which is a highly branched polysaccharide that can be broken down quickly to supply energy to tissues. Other polysaccharides, such as cellulose, chitin, and peptidoglycan, serve as structural molecules in organisms. The most abundant polysaccharide is cellulose. Cellulose is a straight-chain polymer of glucose, like amylose, but it differs in the configuration of the bonds between the glucose units. Most organisms are unable to break these bonds and cannot use cellulose as a source of energy. Instead, cellulose is used to add strength to plant cell walls. Chitin is a structural polysaccharide found in animals and fungi. It makes up the exoskeleton of insects and crustaceans. Its unique properties are a result of chitin having amino groups attached to its sugar monomers. Peptidoglycans are complex polysaccharides found in the cell walls of bacteria. The macromolecule is both flexible and rugged due to its structure. Each monomer of the polysaccharide has a peptide chain attached to it. Often, we refer to carbohydrates as being either simple sugars or complex carbohydrates. Monosaccharides and disaccharides are commonly referred to as simple sugars. The term complex carbohydrates refers to the polysaccharides. In this video, we will be going over protein. We will be covering why we need protein, the best sources of protein, how much we should consume, risk factors in consuming too much protein. You probably already know that protein is very important for our bodies, but did you know that next to water, protein is the most abundant substance in our body? And yes, protein is extremely important for us to consume on a daily basis. Proteins are the building blocks for repairing muscle, skin, blood cells, and even bones. Proteins are also key components of antibodies that help protect us from disease, and hormones that regulate several bodily functions, and enzymes that control chemical activities throughout the body. Protein can be found in meat, fish, poultry, eggs, nuts, and seeds, and tofu. When you eat a protein such as an egg, your body breaks down the protein during digestion into amino acids. These are the building blocks that the body uses for its growth and repair. There are 20 different types of amino acids which make up the different proteins. They vary in size and shape and are used for different functions in the body. There are nine essential amino acids. The word essential means that we must get these amino acids from eating other protein. There are also 11 non-essential amino acids. Don't let the word non-essential fool you. Our body needs these, but non-essential means that our bodies can produce these on their own and it is not necessary to consume these in our diet. Our bodies need both essential and non-essential amino acids to perform correctly. Foods that have all nine essential amino acids in the approximate amounts that our bodies need are called complete proteins. Foods that are considered to be complete proteins include meat, fish, poultry, eggs, milk, cheese, quinoa, and tofu. Typically proteins from plant sources are considered incomplete proteins in that they do not contain all the essential amino acids. 
Foods that are incomplete proteins are nuts, grains, and legumes. It is possible to make a complete protein by combining two of these foods together, as long as they, in combination, make up the nine essential proteins. For example, you could combine rice and beans together. Singly, they are both incomplete proteins, but together they make up a complete protein. These are called complementary proteins, which means two or more incomplete proteins that when combined together make up a complete protein. It is not necessary to eat complementary proteins at every meal. Just make sure that you eat a variety of proteins throughout the day. Your body will take what it needs from each protein. The key would be to eat variety. Now let's talk about how much protein you need in your diet. It is estimated at 10 to 15 percent of your total caloric intake or 0.36 per pound of weight. An example of this is if a person was 150 pounds, you would take 0.36 and multiply it by 150. This would give you the amount of protein in grams you should consume per day. Endurance and strength athletes can have up to 0.5 to 0.8 grams per pound. You need to consume protein on a daily basis. Your body will either use what you eat, and if it doesn't need it at the time, it will either use it as energy or store it as fat. Keep in mind that your body is only capable of using approximately 20 grams of protein at a time. So you are better off eating smaller quantities throughout the day. A three ounce serving of chicken contains approximately 20 grams of protein. And to give you a better idea, three ounces of meat is approximately the size of your computer mouse. Likewise, if you have one cup of legumes, you will consume approximately 15 to 20 grams of protein. And a cup of milk has eight to 12 grams of protein. Many students believe that by eating more protein, they will build more muscle, since protein is needed to build muscle. But consider this, to build one pound of muscle in one week, which is fairly hard to do, you would only need an extra 14 grams of protein. Matter of fact, if you consume too much protein, it can have some serious consequences, such as dehydration, heart disease, hypertension, kidney problems, fatigue, and osteoporosis. So it is best to eat the right amount of protein for your body weight and activity level and also consume a variety of different types of protein throughout the day. I hope you found this to be interesting and wish you a very and healthy life. Olive oil is 100% fat. There's nothing else in it. Pancake mix, on the other hand, is only about 11% fat. And yet, olive oil is good for you, and pancake mix is not. Why is that? As it turns out, the amount of fat we eat doesn't impact our weight or our cholesterol or our risk of heart disease nearly as much as what kind of fat we eat. But let's back up. What is fat? If we were to zoom in on a salmon, which is a fatty fish, past the organs, past the tissues, into the cells, we would see that the stuff we call fat is actually made up of molecules called triglycerides, and they are not all alike. Here's one example. Those three carbons on the left, that's glycerol. Now you can think of that as the backbone that holds the rest of the molecule together. The three long chains on the right are called fatty acids, and it's subtle differences in the structures of these chains that determine whether a fat is, let's say, solid or liquid. 
whether or not it goes rancid quickly, and most importantly, how good or how bad it is for you. Let's take a look at some of these differences. One is length. Fatty acids can be short or long. Another more important difference is the type of bond between the carbon atoms. Some fatty acids have only single bonds. Others have both single and double bonds. Fatty acids with only single bonds are called saturated, and those with one or more double bonds are called unsaturated. Now, most unsaturated fats are good for you, while saturated fats are bad for you in excess. For saturated fats, the story pretty much ends there, but not for unsaturated fats. The double bonds in these molecules have kind of a weird property. They're rigid. So that means that there are two ways to arrange every double bond. The first is like this, where both hydrogens are on the same side and both carbons are on the same side. The second way is like this. Now the hydrogens and carbons are on opposite sides of the double bond. Now, even though both of these molecules are made up of exactly the same building blocks, they are two completely different substances and they behave completely differently inside of us. The configuration on the left is called cis, which you've probably never heard of. The one on the right is called trans, and you probably have heard of trans fats before. They don't go rancid, they're more stable during deep frying, and they can change the texture of foods in ways that other fats just can't. They're also terrible for your health, by far worse than saturated fat, even though technically they're a type of unsaturated fat. Now I know that seems crazy, but your body doesn't care what a molecule looks like on paper. All that matters is the 3D shape, where the molecule fits, where it doesn't, and what pathways it interferes with. So how do you know if a food has trans fat in it? Well, the only sure way to know is if you see the words partially hydrogenated in the ingredients list. Don't let nutrition labels or advertising fool you. The FDA allows manufacturers to claim that their products contain, quote, zero grams of trans fat, even if they actually have up to half a gram per serving. But there are no hard and fast rules about how small a serving can be, and that means you'll have to rely on seeing those key words, partially hydrogenated, because that's how trans fats are made, by partially hydrogenating unsaturated fats. So let's go back to our olive oil and pancake mix from before. Olive oil is 100% fat. Pancake mix is only 11% fat. But olive oil is mostly unsaturated fat, and it has no trans fat at all. On the other hand, more than half the fat in pancake mix is either saturated or trans fat. And so even though olive oil has 10 times as much fat as pancake mix, it's healthy for you, whereas pancake mix is not. Now, I'm not trying to pick on pancake mix. There are lots of foods with this type of fat profile. The point is this. It's not how much fat you eat. It's what kind of fat. And what makes a particular fat healthy or unhealthy is its shape.